Hello. So today I'm going to take a look at The Spark of Modernism, 20 Speculative Stories and Writings that Defined an Era, 1886 to 1939, edited by William Gillard, James Ryder, and Robert Stauffer. And we're looking at story number two, Enoch Soames, A Memory of the 1890s by Max Beerbohm. This is an amazing story. <laughs> and some people say, well, it's just about time travel or it's just about science fiction or a deal with the devil. But that's not its focus at all. Its actual focus is about a pair of guys in their 20s in college and their pretensions for wanting to be famous. So it's a story that is pretty much the same as nowadays, that people want to be famous, they want to get likes, they want to get lots of followers on their channels, and these two young guys really want all of those things. And in the time of this, which is London in 1893, the way of doing that, at least as far as they're concerned, is to write books, write poetries, write essays, and to have lots of people like them in cool places, and to wear cool clothes, and to drink cool drinks, and all that kind of stuff that many college kids think is the uh, be-all and end-all of life. And what makes this story even more amazing is that it's written by Max Beerholm. Beerbohm. Come on, kitty. No, no, no. <laughs> Sweet. Off. Off. Jeez Louise, cat is uh, being a little enthusiastic today. All right, so the story is written by Max Beerbohm, and he went to Oxford. So this was the life that he lived. So he's, in essence, writing about his own life because he was an author, and he did hang out at all the cool clubs and have the cool friends and all that kind of stuff. And he's writing a caricature of the things that he did, and he's adding in some real people and some made-up people, including the uh, Enoch Soames. So we start out with him, Max, Max the character, <laughs> looking back on his life of when he was a young kid and saying that when he looks back at that life, he finds different people in it that he remembers from when he was a, uh, I'd say kid, but, you know, a college student. But he can't find any mention of Enoch Soames, and he finds that a little sad because Enoch Soames was a friend of his, and Enoch really wanted to be a very well-known poet. And clearly he failed if he's not in these books of famous poets of the time. So he says, I want to tell the story of how I knew Enoch and what happened to him and how he ended up not being in any of these books of the great poets at this time period. So he, he's writing this from a later period saying, it's sad that my friend Enoch didn't end up in any of these books of famous poems and let's talk about why. So he goes back to the summer term of 1893. <laughs> So summer term of 1893, he's at Oxford, which is a college, and he's studying, you know, writing and poetry and all that other kind of stuff. And in comes a meteor from the world. It is Will Rothenstein, who is an actual artist. So this guy, Will, is also 21. So he's a, already a famous artist, very well known, and he's coming in to do uh, portraits of people. So course the main character Max is super excited about meeting this famous artist and being able to talk to him and go to all the best clubs and all these other kinds of stuff with this uh, wild outrageous guy from the mystical city of Paris. So Will Rothenstein was 21 which is you know pretty much the same age as Matt. He knew Whistler, he knew all sorts of famous people, he knew Paris so he was someone that everyone in the local uh, town of London in Oxford was envious of and uh, wanted to be near because, you know, he's this famous person that they all think is super cool. So Will settles into London. The two of them go out clubbing. They go drinking vermouth. They go drinking, um, you know, all sorts of random other things. They're smoking tobacco. They're going to the coolest clubs. So they're living life up as college students and having fun and feeling like they know people and they're being seen by people and all that other kind of stuff. So people are, they're hanging out at a club and people are pointing out Rothenstein and saying, oh, look, it's him, that famous artist. And, you know, of course, Max is super happy that he's being in the, the presence of this famous person and being seen with him. And then a strange person comes in. So this is the third person, Enoch Soames. And where the two uh, characters we've met so far are like, you know, dressed perfectly and drinking the perfect drinks and being in the perfect clubs and so on. This new person is stooping, shambling pale. He's got a thin, vague beard. His hairs were weakly curled. Uh, he's got a soft black hat of a clerical kind and a gray waterproof cape, which, because it was waterproof, failed to be romantic. So um, Enoch wants to be cool. <laughs> 
he is aspiring to be cool, but he is just an local, local English guy, and he's a few years older than them, so he's about, let's say, 25. And he is hanging out in these college club places, trying to be cool, trying to be thought of as this amazing poet with all sorts of uh, pretentious kinds of stuff, but he's just not quite doing it properly. And again, this is something that we know perfectly well from modern times, how some people really want to be part of the cool scene and they just don't quite get it. So at this time, Max is really fawning over Rothenstein, who is the artist. And if he hadn't been with Rothenstein, he probably would have fawned over Enoch because Enoch has actually published a book. And, you know, Max is a college-age kid and wants to write books and all this other kind of stuff. But because he's with Rothenstein, and Rothenstein's a little more astute in all of this, Rothenstein realizes that Enoch is a poser, and that sort of rubs off on Max to say that he's a poser. So Enoch comes up to the table and says, you don't remember me, and Rothenstein says, oh, wait, I do. You're uh, Edwin Soames. He says, no, no, I'm Enoch Soames. <laughs> he says, oh, yes, we, we met in Paris a couple times. And he says, yes, we met in Paris. So they invite him to sit at their table, and... Enoch orders absinthe, which was a uh, dangerous drink at the time. They thought that it had poison in it and all of this. There's, there's all sorts of uh, history around absinthe. And for a while it was forbidden. You can drink it. So he's drinking absinthe to be cool. He thinks it's a cool <laughs> forbidden drink. And this is all part of his uh, atmosphere that he's trying to put out. So while he's drinking his absinthe, he manages to put in a mention of his book that he's written. And he says, I explained it all in the preface and negations. And the um, artist says, negations? He said, yes, I gave you a copy of it. So he's uh, deliberately trying to push into the conversation that, yes, he's a published author. He has this book out there and everyone should be reading it, which clearly they aren't. <laughs> so he tries to uh, say some other things to show them that he's a cool person, but he doesn't quite do it. And it says, it occurs to you that he, um, Soames, was a fool. It did it to me. I was young and had not the clarity of judgment that Rothenstein already had. Soames was quite five or six years older than either of us. Also, he had written a book. It was wonderful to have written a book. <laughs> Which, you know, is, is true for many uh, writers. The, this clearly was in the days before heavy self-publishing. So at that time, to write a book was something that could only be achieved with uh, actual acclaim and support of other people. Nowadays, with self-publishing, it's fairly easier to write a book. But in any case, so uh, Soames has written a book of poems, and he's uh, he's writing another book, which is going to be a book of poems, and the artist tries to ask what the title is, and Soames refuses to talk about the title of the second book, and says he's not going to give it any title at all. He says, if the book is good in itself, but Rothenstein <laughs> says, you can't have a book with no title. If I went to a bookseller's and said simply, have you got blank or have you got a copy of blank how would they even know what I wanted so I love all of this kind of conversation and you know clearly Rothenstein is the intelligent person in this grouping and Soames is um being pretentious ordering his absinthe trying to dress in these cool clothes but doesn't really have a sense of how all this sort of thing works so anyway he says that uh, he'll put his name on the cover and he wants a drawing of himself on the front of it and Rothenstein is a famous artist, so clearly Soames is trying to lure him into, please do a picture of me so I can use it on the cover of my book and it can be a bestseller and all this other kind of stuff. But Rothenstein says that he's uh, heading out, looks at his uh, watch, says it's time to go, and they abandon Soames there drinking his absinthe. And Max, the main character, says, well, why didn't you draw him? All he wanted was to be drawn for his book. And he said, well, but he's just not really a person of any importance. So we go on. Um, Max, the main character, decides that he's going to buy this book, the first book that Soames wrote, and see what it's all about. So he buys it, and he tries to read it, and he finds it completely indecipherable, which uh, all makes sense with the character involved. He likes to write pretentious things, but he can't really get himself together to write things that make any sense. So Max buys the book and leaves it around his room. And then whenever someone sees it, he says, oh, it's a book by a friend I know, said, to try to make himself self-important. But he doesn't actually know what it's about. So 
We talk about how the book is uh, indecipherable and how it's got things in it that just seem to be pretentious. And he says, well, you know, maybe I'm just not understanding its actual meaning. Maybe it's me who's dull and doesn't understand its layers of meaning. And it's not that the book actually lacks meaning. So then they get around to a second time that they meet. So now they're in January and they're back at the same club. And Max happens to see Enoch sitting at a table and he goes over to talk to him. And uh, Enoch is still being as uh, grumpy or dull or not really able to talk about things and making comments about famous poems and so on that other people wouldn't think were uh, meaningful. But he does talk about going to the reading room of the British Museum every day, that he likes to be there because it lowers one's vitality. <laughs> so he likes to go there and read famous works while his vitality is lowered. And then he mentions that he worships the devil, that he is a Catholic but he also worships the devil, so he's some sort of a combination where he's both Catholic and also a devil worshiper. And he's saying these things because, again, he sort of wants attention. You know, I'm sure we all know people like this that are in their uh, mid-twenties that are looking for attention, looking for fame, and they'll say things because that is the way to do it. So he says that he is preparing to release his second book. And the uh, main character, Max, says, oh, did, are you going to publish it without a title? He said, no, no. I found a title, but I'm not going to tell you what it is. So he's still playing these games of trying to get people interested in his things that he's writing. So we go on through these. It turns out that the book is called Fungoids. <laughs> Max, the main character, reads the book and once again thinks that it's full of uh, pretentious stuff and that it's just indecipherable. And again, he sort of wonders maybe a little less this time that maybe it's not me <laughs> maybe it's actually that this poet just doesn't know what they're doing so they have a couple of things and they're talking about one of the poems is about the devil about the uh, poet Enoch meeting the devil and how they feel about it so in the meantime we've got you know Enoch this is a second book no one is buying it no one is reading it people find it uh, indecipherable and in the meantime the main character the author Max is actually getting uh, work. He's getting his writings written, he's getting people praising him, and so on. And the uh, Enoch is grumpy about his books not selling, but he tries to pass it off and say, oh, you think I care? Well, I don't actually care. All this stuff is meaningless. So the main character says, well, you know, I'm being part of the Yellow Book, which is a, a publication in the area. Maybe you should try to submit to the Yellow Book. And Enoch says, bah! who even reads the yellow book that's a place of uh, stupid stuff. But then it turns out a day or two later, uh, Enoch does actually submit stuff to the yellow book and the editors there say, this is trash, we're not going to submit it. So um, Max, the main character, hears that at least Enoch has uh, inheritance and that he's living off his inheritance. So it's not like he's starving to death. So he says, all right, that's all right. You know, he wants to be a poet. He's not quite a good poet. That's all right. He's uh, making enough money to pay his bills through his inheritance, and that is all right. And he is also the, uh, Soames is the son of a unsuccessful and deceased bookseller in Preston. So he um, comes from a literary line. He's failing at the literary world, but at least he has money to live on. So Max, the main character says to his artist friend, this is really sad that this poor guy wants to write poetry, nobody likes his poetry, and no one's reading his stuff. So while the artist laughs at that, the artist does feel sad enough about it that he makes a portrait of Enoch Soames. So they're at the New English Art Club a few weeks later, and there's a pastel portrait of Enoch Soames, Esquire, and it was very like him. It, you know, it, it represented him well. And Rothenstein did a good job at it. You know, he didn't just do a half, half, um, a uh, poor job. <laughs> Trying not to swear. He tried, he didn't do a poor job of it. He did a good job of portraying what Enoch Soames looked like. And while it's, while the portrait is hanging in this art club, Enoch Soames stands by the portrait pretty much every single hour of every single day that the place is open so that people could recognize him and know that he was the target of a famous portrait by a famous artist. So this is his moment of fame. It's not his poetry or his 
essays or anything else he's written. It's that someone took pity on him and did a portrait of him and hung it in a place that people actually went. So some sits there standing by his portrait all the time, every day. And once that show closes, he's pretty much lost his chance on fame. So Max found him in the club again, but now he is looking very unhappy. And while Soames used to drink absinthe to be showy and to say that he was cool and that he's drinking this dangerous drink, now he's drinking it because he's an alcoholic, because he has nothing left in the world. His poetry has failed. His one chance at fame with this art thing is now closed, and there isn't anything else left for him. So he's wholly unhappy. In the meantime, Max, the person who's writing this, is doing very well. He's got articles in all sorts of different places. He's got features in all sorts of different places. And he's living a good life. So he's living the life that Enoch Soames had always wanted to live. And he can feel that difference between the two of them. And, you know, there isn't anything he can do about it. He can't make the other guy better. And the other guy is just wholly depressed that his goal in life is uh, completely a failure. So now we reach <laughs> the moment of truth. So Max, the main character, decides that he's going to eat at a little cafe. This cafe, so now we're in um, 97, 1897, so uh, four years later. So four years later, he decides to eat a little cafe. A year ago, this cafe was like the hip and coolest place, but, you know, time has passed it on. You know, that was a whole year ago. <laughs> now people have gone somewhere else. That's cool. And it's a pretty quiet place. So he goes down into this little cafe, and he finds that Soames is there. And Soames is there alone at one table. And then another guy who is uh, very devilish looking, very uh, cliche devilish looking, is sitting at a different table. So there's only two tables in this place that have any people at them at all. And Max feels guilty about just ignoring Soames and not going over to sit with him. So he says, all right, can I sit with you? And Soames is being super grumpy by this point. But he says, sure, you know, he's not going to turn someone away. So... Uh, Max spends some time looking at the devil character and reeking in that, you know, he looks predatory. He has sinister looks and all that other kind of stuff. So Enoch Soames says, well, you know, no one bought my book when it first came out. And even here, four years later, no one's buying my book at all. But maybe in a hundred years, maybe someone in the future is going to appreciate it. And, you know, we've seen that, of course, with all sorts of kinds of books that when they come out, People of the current era, and with artwork too, people of the current era don't appreciate them, but when they eventually get their due course in the future, people appreciate them and laud them and they're uh, treasured as wonderful artists and authors and all that other kind of stuff. So that's where Soames has gone with his mind, that maybe everyone in the current world sucks, but maybe in the future I will be celebrated and wouldn't it be cool to be able to appreciate that celebration. So he says that, and... The devil at the other table comes over and says, ha ha, <laughs> so you want to go 100 years in the future and see that you are celebrated by the world. Well, you could do that if you just sell me your soul. And the main character, Max, laughs because, I mean, you're sitting at a little cafe in London and someone comes over and says, I'm the devil, I'm going to sell, you're going to sell your soul to me. And it's pretty ridiculous sounding. But the devil is pretty... Um, determined, says, I am the devil, and I can send you a hundred years in the future, and you'll be able to see how well you are appreciated a hundred years in the future. And Soames, of course, says yes, immediately, because his entire life sucks. Nobody likes him, no one reads him, no one appreciates him, and at least if he goes a hundred years into the future, he'll know that he was this amazing poet that everyone adored, and then if he goes to hell, he doesn't care. So the two of them make an agreement and say, yes, I'll get to go to the future. I'm going to go to the afternoon of June 3rd, 1997. And then I will be in the reading room and I will be there until closing time. And then when I get back, you know, I'm going to go to hell for the rest of my life. And the devil says, yep, this is perfect. And of course, uh, Max is saying, no, don't do this. This is crazy. You know, never mind, is this person really the devil? But if they are the devil, you don't want to roast in hell for the entire rest of your life just to see if you're famous a hundred years in the future. But clearly, Soames feels differently. So Soames agrees, and then he pops off, and he is gone. 
So the he's not going to pop off and appear immediately. He's going to pop off and then he's going to be gone for the afternoon while he's at the reading room. And then he will come back in the evening. So now the main character, Max, is left with his friend having vanished. And he goes wandering around and doesn't know what to do. And you know, should he tell someone? But I mean, who's going to believe him? So he just wanders around aimlessly. And then he goes back to the little cafe again so that he can be there when the, his friend Enoch Soames comes back from the future and tells him what he found. So he waits and waits and waits. And when the guy finally comes back, he just looks exhausted. So um, Max orders some burgundy, some wine, and whatever food is available. And he realizes from the look on Enoch's face that clearly Enoch did not find what he was looking for. That even when he went 100 years in the future, that no one was <laughs> writing about him, about how he was this amazing poet. So... He orders the wine and he says, don't be discouraging. Perhaps it's only that you didn't leave enough time. Maybe two or three centuries, that's maybe someone will appreciate you. And then, um, you know, Enoch says, well, I've thought of that. And Max says, well, we have to have you hide because you can't just let the devil take you away because he's going to sentence you to everlasting hell. <laughs> maybe you can go somewhere and, you know, Soames is pretty much, you know, it's going to be doomed. The devil has um, control over everywhere. No matter where I try to go, he's going to be able to find me. So it turns out that Soames, who went into the future, is not only upset that he wasn't recognized, but about something else that he discovered. So he's not willing to talk about it, and Max has to really drag it out of him about what the future was like and what he found. So, you know, Max is asking him, what did the reading room look like? Much as usual. How many people there? The usual sort. What did they look like? They all look very much like each other. So at this point, <laughs> Max goes into this whole long discussion about, oh, wait, did they have a uniform with a number on it? A number with a large disc of metal with numbers on it? And then the men and women all were very smelling cleanly and they were all hairless and they were all shorn. So, for some strange reason, Max knows exactly what this future world of a hundred years in the future looks exactly like. And it turns out, the reason that we have this section in here is that there was a story written by Jerome J. Jerome called The New Utopia. And this was in 1891, so around the same time period. And it has this very same kind of future written in it, where the people wore these kinds of clothes. So he's making a reference, Max of this story is making a reference to Jerome K. Jerome's story, The New Utopia, in this, saying that, oh, look, he actually knew what kind of a stupid world was going to be in the future, where we all look exactly alike, we're dressed in the exact same clothes, we all just have numbers for names. And clearly, you know, we are past this time period, so we know that it wasn't like this. But it is also pretty funny to think about how people in the past thought the future was going to be and how really not that much changes in some senses, although they never would have imagined the internet and all of the other kinds of things that were happening around there. So anyway, he's making references saying, I think it's just going to be like the future of Jerome K. Jerome. And he says, yes, it was exactly that kind of future. But that's not the important part <laughs> because... Enoch wants to care about his own poetry. That's the only thing he cares about. He doesn't care about the actual progress of humanity and all of this. So he goes and he tries to look for himself in the catalog and he doesn't find himself. So then he goes and asks the librarian and says, Yo, am I looking in the right place? And they say, yep, you're looking in the right place. So now he's even more depressed that he's not finding himself in this catalog. So then there, he's told to look in this book by Mr. T.K. Nupton, which has the best review of this time period. And he goes through and looks at that, and he finds that there is a reference to him, but it's not the kind of reference that he was expecting. And even more than that, he copies it out, and apparently in the hundred years, you know, we've certainly read things by Shakespeare and know that during the progression from the 1600s to the current time period, that spellings have changed and that some word cho choices have changed. But apparently somehow between his time period in the late 1890s 
in our current time period, we have completely changed our writing language and gone to a wholly um, phonetic kind of language where if we're going to say value, we're going to say V-A-L-L-U. And if we're going to say as, we're going to do A-Z. If we're going to say how, we're going to say H-O-U. So this whole thing is now written in phonetic spelling, which, you know, there's tons and tons of books nowadays that do that kind of thing for fun. But this is one of the earlier ones that did it. And there's an entire paragraph written in phonetic spelling. So you have to sit there and spell it out word by word. So this says now is N-O-U and so on. So it's fun to read. And you must certainly worth the effort for them to spell that all out. And it says, I found that by murmuring the words aloud, a device which I commend to my reader, I was able to master them little by little. And what he realizes is that he, Max, the person who didn't go to the future, has written about this experience. And they met, they mentioned Max Beerbohm in this little blurb here. And that when he wrote about the experience, about his friend Enoch Soames making a deal with the devil, Everyone thinks that it's a fake time travel story, that it's not a real story. And that's the only reason that Enoch Soames is known in the future, because of a famous story by Max Beerbohm, a fiction story about a fake person, Enoch Soames. So people don't even think that Enoch Soames was a real person, which, of course, Enoch Soames is super grumpy about that. Not only does his poetry not appreciate it, but that he's thought to be fictional because he was so meaningless that his works were completely lost. So Max tries to say, you know, are you sure you copied this little blurb the way that it actually was? And he says, yes. And so Max says, well, there must be some mistake. Clearly, I'm not going to write about this situation and people aren't going to think you're fake. And they get into an argument about all of it. Because clearly he went to the future and this is what is documented in the future. So clearly it happened because otherwise it wouldn't be in the future. So while they're in the middle of this argument, the devil shows up. <laughs> and the devil is saying, all right, it's time for you to come with me to hell. And uh, Enoch Soames is saying, all right, fine, take me to hell. Because, you know, clearly I failed in everything in life and it doesn't even matter anymore. Poor Max is trying to save him, so Max makes his knives into the shape of a cross, and this does actually stop the devil for a minute, but Enoch Soames changes the knives so that they're not a cross anymore because he just doesn't want to fight it. He just wants to go off with the devil. So off the two of them go, and Max tries to run after them, but they are gone, and now he's like, well, what do I do now? You know, this poet who has written a couple of books and who has a room that he's renting and so on has just vanished and I was the last person seen with him people are going to think I murdered him or something like that and I can't tell them that he went with the devil because no one's going to believe me they're going to think I'm absolutely crazy but as it turns out Soames was so little recognized and you know people paid such little attention to him that no one even notices that is gone you know, the landlady of the apartment that he's renting has enough stuff in his room that she just sells it off and then hires a new or, you know, rents the place to a new person. No one ever even notices that his book is not selling because no one ever thought about it. So the author is pretty upset that this person vanishes completely from life and no one even cares or notices. And he thinks that's pretty sad. And he says that over the future years, he saw the devil a couple of times. And a couple of years ago in Paris, he was walking along a road and he saw the devil walking along the road toward him. And he was you know, clearly grumpy that the devil had taken his friend off to hell. And he wanted to be grumpy to him, but he was so much the gentleman by this point and so used to social niceties that he actually nodded and smiled to him because it was just the thing that one did when one was passing a man on the road. And the devil stared straight at me with the utmost haughtiness. And so the main character, Max, was, um, he says, cut to, you know, he was put down. He was dismissed by the devil and that made him grumpy. That's how the book ends, is that Max is super upset that the devil looked down on him and didn't acknowledge him and treated him like dirt. And I still am furious at having had that happen to me. So it's all about 
your reputation. It's all about how people uh, respect you and pay attention to you and treat you. That's how it ends. That's how it starts. The time travel is a little bit of it, but the time travel's purpose is only about them going to the future to, pu to prove to Soames that he was a person of worth. And it, what it proved was that he wasn't a person of worth, that his friend Max Beerbohm was the person of worth because he's the one that got mentioned on all of this and that Enoch Soames is just an imaginary character at this. So this is very worth reading. You know, it was written back in 1916. It was set in the 1893 to 1897 time period. But it's about college-age kids um, thinking that they know everything, wanting to be famous, wanting to get likes, wanting to get followers. And the things they will do when they are not getting the things that they want and how they treat each other when one of them really wants to be popular and the other one happens to become popular and the first one is jealous of the second and all that kind of stuff. So well, well recommended. All sorts of great little details in here about them trying to drink the latest drinks or go to the latest cafes or being seen at the latest clubs or all that sort of stuff. So let me know if you have any questions.